Today it's an exceptional day, and uh, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce the first speaker of Open Readings Conference. Uh, first, the second. The is too small to host all students, professors, researchers at this hall, and the reason is well known. Today we have Ben Faringa, the speaker of the Nobel Laureate, my good friend, I can say, from 2008, when he was first time in Vilnius. And also, in addition, he had some students from our university, from our laboratory in his group. And I just uh, will tell shortly his biography, of course, his CV, of course, you read on the internet, but nevertheless, uh, you should know that he obtained a PhD degree from the University of Groningen, and almost all his life is in Groningen University, though there's some breaks during his career. After uh, he completed his PhD degree, he uh, started uh, to work as a research scientist at Shell in the Netherlands and then in the UK. He was appointed lecturer later and full professor in 1988 at the University of Groningen and named the Jacobus van Hoff Distinguished Professor of Molecular Sciences in 2004. He was elected foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is member and vice president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences. In 2008, he was appointed academy professor and was knighted by Her Majesty the Queen of the Netherlands. And if I'm correct, last week you met the King of the Netherlands, or two weeks ago, it was on, on your website. Of course, uh, Faringa's research is well recognized by numerous awards around the world. I am not talking about the Nobel Prize last year, which he shared together with Jean-Pierre Savage and uh, uh, Fraser Scudder. And uh, I can tell my, my story. We were waiting uh, the announcement uh, of Nobel uh, Prize in Chemistry in one room with some students. And when two names were announced, I said the said name immediately. And then people asked me, how did you know this name? I said, actually, he should name the first one, because his research in supramolecular chemistry, in chirality, in, meta, in many other uh, topics, is really uh, pioneering and uh, very, very well known around the world. I don't know whether uh, Ben will show some movies. He has in his lectures some movies, what molecules, molecules do. Actually, it's amazing what man can create what can do with the molecules. So I'm pleased to give the floor to Ben Faringa and please welcome the speaker of the open readings. Is this on? We switch to on. I cannot use this one. Oh. Sorry. Okay, so I have to stand here. Eugenius, many thanks for your uh, very kind words. It's uh, fantastic to be here and to see so many people. I was here indeed in uh, 2008 at this uh, Baltic uh, symposium, chemistry symposium, and I enjoyed every moment. And it's great to be here again. So. Uh, 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 what I want to do is not to talk about everything, like the previous speaker this morning. I'm a, I'm a, a very modest man. I can speak only about small molecules, you know, and uh, maybe how we are going to do some movement with molecules and so on. So what I want to talk about is how we build small molecules, the art of building small, and particularly about molecular switches and motors. And when I got this invitation last year, now almost a year ago, I think it was March last year by your colleagues. I was really pleased to have the opportunity to come back here. So, let me go back in, in time a little bit to the early days of flying. And these gentlemen, the Wright brothers, uh, although people have been, have been flying, trying to fly, I must say, for centuries, and many of them were killed by, in the attempt, the Wright brothers succeeded in this primitive machine to fly for the first time a couple of yards. And what people said at that time, why should man fly? If God wanted us to fly, he would have given us wings. Nobody would have predicted that a hundred years later in Europe we would build this Airbus which carries hundreds of people at a speed of 900 kilometers an hour across the ocean. 
Nobody would have predicted at that time. And often we in this field, like also my colleagues, Stoddard, Sauvage, and the others in the molecular machine field, feel a little bit like the Wright brothers. It looks very primitive what we do with molecules. But I hope I can convince you that this is a step towards the materials of the future, or devices, or small robotics. We are inspired, like these gentlemen, like so many, by the flying of the bird. But realize that if they would have built a plane with the flying principle of the bird, you would never get to America in an airplane. I would have not been here in the airplane from Amsterdam. And also the materials are completely different. The three million parts of this Airbus, or the Boeing 747, they are completely artificial and synthetic. So the material is not the material of the bird, and the flying principle is not the flying principle of the bird, but it's extremely effective for the purpose where we designed this plane for, that is to carry this, all these people. All we know, after a hundred years, we have to be modest, because we cannot build a bird. We cannot build a single cell of that bird. And even your biology colleagues, although they are, ex I've seen some beautiful science here already this morning, they are not able to build one compartment of the cell of the bird yet. So modesty is in this place. There's still a long way to go. So chemists are extremely good in building molecules, and I'm a synthetic chemist. And this can be very simple molecules from ethylene, which is just carbon and hydrogen. 160 million tons a year, the basis for plastics and many other products, of course, or a very complex molecule like a vitamin B12, which has many different atoms, and only 35 tons a year are produced of this essential vitamin in the world. That's the total world production of this complex <coughs> molecule. This sets the stage because we are capable of building all these products, from cables to cars, from pills to dyes and of course our smartphones. This is where we are very good in, in building materials, building our drugs, etc. But what we are not very good in is to introduce dynamic functions. And so let's go back again to modern nature. The ATPA's rotary motor, which is in your cell membrane, which is an important catalyst, I'll come back to that. The bio nanomotors that take care for transport into your cells. The uh, ribosome, which is a fantastic machinery that creates the proteins. The bacteria flagella motor that makes bacteria swim. There are 50 or so different motors in your body that are involved in all essential, pro almost all essential processes, I must say. Cell division, movement, transport, etc. We were very much inspired in the early days by the optical switching in the eye, and I will tell you in a second why. But let me show you how we started. I started as a PhD student, like so many here, as a young scientist, with building molecules in a synthetic lab. And I synthesized this molecule, which was a so-called overcrowded alkane, which we published in GX in 1977 when I was a student in Groningen. And then I forgot about this molecule, because after my PhD I moved to work for Shell, and of course they were not interested in this at all, because I worked on petrochemicals and catalysis. But then when I started my independent career in Groningen, uh, one of the topics I was working on is information storage at the molecular level, using light. Yeah? So to do, basically the idea was optical information storage and optical computing. And then I realized that in our eye, there is this very simple process of cis-trans isomerization around a carbon-carbon double bond. And then I realized I made this overcrowded alkenes, which exactly have a central double bond that is photochemically active. So this is then what I used for gut optical switching, as you see our first paper. And then later on, we went to the motors, etc., etc., etc. I don't want to go through it because I will tell you examples of that story in the coming 50 minutes or so. But this is how it all started. And you might say, did I ever thought that this molecule, which I made in the laboratory as a master student, did that ever brought me to a Nobel Prize? Uh, of course not. But as a young scientist, we all have our dreams. And I'm sure you all dream about your future, what you discover. And please discover, eh? because being in science, being in university educations, there's ample opportunity to learn and to discover. And try to realize your dreams. And then maybe you might get a nice medal afterwards. 
So we started with switching. And the whole idea was like in your eye, you switch back and forth between 0 and 1. And can we do that in an artificial manner to write information? And so this is the switch in your eye, a bent molecule, the retinol. And of course, you switch it to a more linear molecule, and this is bound to the opsin in your eye. It changes the conformation in the protein. The signal goes to your brain. And then we can see. But it should switch back and forth, eh? because if it switches only with light in this direction, I see you once, and then it's over. So it has to switch back. And we all know, when you look in a bright lamp, I don't see you for a fraction of a second. And the reason is that too many molecules are in this state and not enough in the zero state. So it takes a while to switch them. Now, why don't we use these molecules? Because when you take them out, the chromophores are not so stable. You cannot make a robust photoswitchable system. So we designed this kind of overcrowded molecules. And you see we can switch with two different wavelengths between an M and a P, a zero and a one. Selective interconversion, chemical and photochemical bistability. That's crucial, eh? zero, one, zero, one and non-destructive readout. And that was a real problem. If you write the information in the beginning, the key problem was how to read out the information without destructing the information. Because you use the same wavelengths of light, you read your information, you switch back. But due to the fact that we make these molecules chiral, a left-handed helix minus, or a positive helix plus, we could switch between 0 and 1, which was a left-handed and a right-handed form. And that could be read out at wavelengths far beyond the wavelengths where we did the switching. So we could make a compact disk, and we did work together with Philips company, for instance, to write information in plastic sheets, and you can write zeros and ones, zeros and ones. And when you calculate how much information you can write in one compact disk, you can have one compact disk and play music for 240 years, constantly. So your grandparents and your grandchildren all can use one compact disk to listen music constantly. That's disastrous for the music industry. <laughs> and of course, it's not reality, because this is what journalists like to tell about nanotechnology. But what we don't know is how to write zeros and ones, zeros and ones with light when they are so closely packed next to each other. Because we can use single molecule techniques, and I know in this, this institute they are quite famous for that, but then we have one molecule here and we have one molecule outside the building and then we can distinguish, of course, very easily. We have not solved this problem, so maybe there is a smart student who can help me with this to solve this problem. So we make devices, you know, for information storage and so those in this kind of system. Now let's go to the cell. So in the cell, we have the cell membrane, as we all know, and we thought, can we now use these switches to control functions in the cell membrane? And in the cell membrane, for instance, you have these gates or channels that uh, can open and close. And we thought the I it would be nice if you would have pore and you build in a, a light switch and you can open and close it with an external signal. Say, if I irradiate with the laser, would it open and close? On demand. So make a nanopore. And what we did is we went to the mechanosensitive channel of the coli bacteria in your body. And why is this protein channel? This is the membrane, actually, and this is sticking through the membrane. This is the side view, this is the top view. And you see here it's closed and here it's open. It opens to a three to four nanometer channel in the open state. Why is it in the coli bacteria in your body? Because it's a pressure, sense, uh, pressure channel. If the pressure builds up and the cell is going to explode, it suddenly opens this valve and material flows out. So that's why it's called the mechanosensitive channel. And we thought, Okay, let's engineer it so that we can build in light switches. So the idea was to have this channel, then modify it so that with UV light, a visible light, we could open and close it, for instance, in a membrane, a vesicle, or an artificial cell. And then we would have some cute device for nanotechnology. So this is what we did. We engineered, we, we engineered the protein complex. So what we did is we went to the genome, modified it so that it expresses cysteines and five cysteines here. And if you have a cysteine, a chemist is happy because you know you can easily hook up whatever molecule to a cysteine, the tile group of cysteine. So we put on these spiropyran switches. These are light switches, small molecules. Five of them were installed here. And now we can irradiate with these wavelengths of light and they switch between these two farms. And you see already this spiropyran in blue 
is a rigid structure, but this open structure here has charges, plus and minus. So it has a strong dipole. And the whole idea was, the reasoning was, if we have five of these dipoles there, they will repel each other, the charges, and they will also become very hydrophilic, so water might flow into the channel and pushes open the protein channel. And that works nicely because when we put it in the wall of an artificial cell, like a giant vesicle or whatever, you can put something in there, then you can hit it with a lamp, the channel opens due to these five switches, material flows out, we can close it and open it. Now this was an exercise in building a complex nano device from partly artificial, partly synthetic components, and it operates. Of course, the ultimate goal is, for instance, to con use it for controlled drug delivery. Eh? When you put in a, a, a drug, can you deliver it open, yeah, this capsule, and then it will be delivered on the spot. Now, if we look at modern nature, and we go from molecules to dynamic molecular systems, we have to realize that assembly, to control assembly, to, con to have to trigger and response functions and motion, are really important challenges there. There is no engineer in the cells that assembles the components. It's all done by self-assembly. And of course, it's all these responsive functions, and we have not much idea how to do this in artificial materials. So maybe we might be able to make responsive materials, smart drugs, and molecular motors. And I will show you examples of those. Another essential aspect that you might not have realized is that in natural systems, in your cells, in your body, it's out of equilibrium. And we as scientists are really good in building things under equilibrium conditions. But your body is out of equilibrium. If you would be in equilibrium, you would be dead. There's constant metabolism to keep the thing out of equilibrium. And we have to learn that. We have no idea yet how to do it. So we built amphiphiles, as you can see here, a, a soap, an amp, a detergent, a polar head group, an aromatic core, an apolar tail. And this core here is built with light-induced switchable capacity, so photo and electrochemical switching. So this is a new type of amphiphile that can form bilayers or membranes. And why did we do that? Because we wanted to make nano-objects by self-assembly, uh, like capsules and tubes, etc and then see if you could trigger with a light signal. So this is what you get when you put these molecules in water. You see these beautiful nanotubes, here's the dimensions, they are 28 nanometer in, in diameter, the walls, the bilayer, is exactly 3 nanometers, they are all uniform by design, we don't do anything, we just put the molecule in water and they assemble, and you can take a vesicle and you can cap it and you can make these kind of structures. This is probably the smallest reaction tube that you have ever seen in your life. You could put material in here, it can flow in here. We use this kind of assemblies now to use them, for instance, as in injection needles to bring a drug into a cell. Why are they so stable? Because these molecules are so designed that these alkyl tails here, you see, they interdigitate like two combs and they maximize von der Waals interactions between the molecules. And that gets very stable. You can take this away, you keep the tube, you can take, <coughs> put it on again with a different load, etc. But now you realize that we build in the core a photoactive group. So here you see one of these tubes, and here you see another one. And now when I hit it with light, let me see if it works. Is there anything moving? Yes. It's a bit light here, but you see this moves and this moves. <coughs> You see a single tubes, you see it? It starts bending and curling, and at the end, it is completely folded. And we can follow the movements of a single nanotube, yeah, by spectroscopy techniques, by fluorescence, for instance, etc. We can tune it. At the end, patches go out, material flows out of these tubes. So we can control by an external signal these self-assembled objects, and now use them for all kinds of smart material purposes. We can also go from tubes to, to vesicles and back from vesicles to tubes, so from rod-like objects to spherical objects. Here you see typical rods, nanotubes. We go to spherical objects. You see the dimensions. This is a, a vesicle. We go to multilaminar vesicles, then we go back to tubes. So we can go through a cycle yeah, of different structures 
at the nanoscale. And we can control it by external signals. And we don't touch it because it's all based on self-assembly. Now, with this, we have make a first step to multi-component responsive systems. But we want to go a step further, and I showed you already that we interfere with a protein channel complex. Now the question is, can we interfere with something that would be useful in your body? And so the idea was to switch biological functions on and off in a real biological setting at the end. And so what we did is we make smart pharmaceuticals. That is to say, we build in these light switches into drugs. And the whole idea is that you take an inactive drug, it goes into your body, and it goes in a certain spot, you hit, hit with a lamp, and you activate it on the spot. So the whole idea is to get high precision therapy. Does it work? Of course, we are not in the clinic yet. So let me make a warning. This is extremely early days. And to develop a drug nowadays takes 10 to 12 years and 1, 1 to 1.4 billion euros. So our systems might take another 25 years before we are really, although we are pushing hard to work with doctors and so on to see what we can do. But this is still a long journey. But we want to work on two, particularly two important problems, bacterial resistance and cancer treatment. Bacterial resistance was called by the World Health Organization one of humanity's ticking time bombs. And uh, although there is a lot of discussion about uh, the climate change, this might probably be a more severe threat to humanity than the climate change. They expect that in the next decade or so, several hundred thousand people might die if we don't do anything on, antibacteri on bacterial resistance build up. And you read in the newspapers now and then about parts of hospitals that have to be closed because of MRSI. Cancer th therapy, we all know about the nasty side effects of chemotherapy if you could have more precision therapy. That would be really useful. So, what do we mean by photopharmacology? So, light on drugs. You have a ligand that doesn't bind very well to a protein receptor, for instance, you irradiate, and then it will bind and it will block, for instance, a certain biological pathway. We know in the clinic light is used a lot. For instance, in photodynamic therapy in cancer treatment, where you generate reactive oxygen species, or in optogenetics, which is a hot area in neurobiology these days, it is now there for 15 years or so. And what do they do in optogenetics? You probably have seen this. They modify the genome, express one of these light uh, sensitive proteins, like rhodopsin based systems, and then they can trigger with a lamp neural functions. And if you look at the web, you can find these movies of rats that have a tiny, tiny hole in their skull, and they have expressed this protein, and then you can induce the rat to do different movements. So I made once this joke and said, look, next time when you buy your uh, ticket for your, uh, for your favorite soccer club in the upper league, eh, you get also this tiny chip implanted, and when then the hooligans get mad and try to demolish the stadium, they switch on the infrared lamps and then all start to sing the national hymn or the whatever. <laughs> I don't think we are going to do this with human beings. Although technically, maybe, it might be possible in the future. With rats it works. But to switch on and off drugs, we take drugs all the time. So our idea was, take an inactive drug, go to the target, and switch it on. So we activate with azobenzines, for instance, which is a light switch, and you can switch on and off the activity. That is the idea, and control in space and time the biological activity. Does it work? Not for patients, of course. We are very early stage. We work with cells. This is a normal drug, a conventional drug. It acts everywhere. A pro-drug, yeah? it's active only after you activate, but then it's distributed to your body and it can do also side effects, etc. The whole idea is with a reversible photocontrol drug that it should act only on the spot, and uh, that's the idea. So we, what we did is we went to, the, to use Cypro, which is a broad spectrum antibiotic. I'm sure several of you have used that when you had an infection. We built in a photo switch, and the idea is that you switch on and off, on, off, on, off the activity of the antibiotic. Does it work? Yes, 
when we have this compound, this is the off state, this is the on state, we can switch on the activity. And when you have a, a, a colony of cells, you can grow bacterial cells in a pattern because you can take a mask, illuminate, when it's illuminated, it does not grow. When it's not illuminated, it grows nicely. We have done this now for several antibiotics. You can switch on and off in both directions. This. Now, going to animal models and so is still a, a way to go. Of course, we work on different kinds of antibiotics now. But the whole idea is to, that there is no resistance built. We also look at bacterial communication. And you all know we talk with each other, but bacteria talk also with each other. And they do this via quorum sensing molecules. These are small molecules to recruit other bacteria to make, for instance, a bacteria film. When you get an implant, for instance, a hip implant, a nasty problem is that you get all kinds of bacteria infections that they form these nice plaques. And so if you could control the communication between bacteria, you might have another regulation mechanism. And that works really beautiful. Here we again, we build in a light switch, and uh, both at the level of the protein, the level of the, uh, of the uh, gene expression, and even at the phenotype, we got up and down regulation. Just to give you an impression, don't look at the data. This is the natural system that is used, to, that the bacteria use for communication. This is in our system with the off state, this is the on state. We pick up almost the activity of the natural system. So we can now interfere with the light signal with bacterial communication recruiting comrades to form a nice bacterial film. And finally, chemotherapy. Would it work? And we took bortezomib, which is used in the clinic for these kind of tumors, and we installed the light switch, and we can switch indeed between proteasome inhibition, yes or no. So we can up and down uh, regulate the activities. And we have done that for a number of, of anti-tumor compounds. Once again, a warning. Don't tell me that we can treat tumor at this stage at all. But we look for innovative approaches. And my dream is that when you have uh, these small tumors, that with the new detection techniques, the new imaging techniques like PET, fluorescence, PET, MRI, and so, you can detect these small tumors. And then on the spot, you can activate the chemotherapeutic agent. With the antibiotics, the dream is that you have here a local infection. You activate your antibiotic. It does not harm the normal bacteria in your body, hopefully. And when it goes out after 12 hours, it's inactive and the bacteria don't build up any resistance anymore. That's a dream still. But the basic principles have been shown here in the laboratory. So to, this, to conclude this, the challenges and perspectives. There are many challenges. And the biggest challenge at this moment is to switch it with visible and near-infrared light. Because you all know you don't want to have long irradiation with UV light because it might be harmful. Furthermore, UV light doesn't penetrate very well. But you all know that infrared light is penetrating. I can have an infrared laser and go straight through my finger. So the doctors tell me, use infrared or near infrared, and you can go to internal organs as well. And this is what we are currently doing. My students make now, and other groups around the world, they make now near infrared switches. And we are now at around 700 nanometers. So we are extremely happy already that we got to that wavelength, because then, it's useful for also applications, ultimately, in biological systems. But of course, we might be able to use it for many other things, like neural functions, biological network regulation, etc. The complexity of a biological network gives ample opportunity if we could up and down regulate certain pathways in a biological network. That would be extremely useful. Maybe that's even more useful than, than ultimately, than a drug. So that's what we try uh, to do with them. So let me continue to molecular motors. And so it all started with these switches. And how did we came to molecular motors? We just published our first guard optical switch, you know, switching from left to right, left to right, back and forth for information storage, in 1991. And then in 1999, we discovered that one of the switches was not switching back, but it was switching forward. And when my students did all the experiments, like circular diagram and NMR and whatever, you figure out it switches 90 degrees and it switches another 90 degrees. That's half a circle, a forward movement. And then suddenly we realized, wow, 
This is half of the movement of a 360 degree movement. And that was the start of our motors. So a rotary motor. So this is a rotary motor in your body, the ATPH. It's a fantastic rotary motor and a great source of inspiration, although it's a complex protein system or so. There are millions of these motors in your body, and I don't know if you realize, these motors, although they are pretty small, a few nanometers, are pretty effective. They produce, ladies and gentlemen, 30 or plus kilograms of ATP every 24 hours in your body, half your body weight if you are not too heavy. <laughs> Half your body weight, realize that, 30 kilograms by these tiny motors. Of course, it's also hydrolyzed again because it's the source of the fuel, the energy in your body. So, one remark about the macro world and the, and the, and the nano world. This is a robot in a car manufacturing plant. This is this robot in your body, the, not the ATPase, but the ribosome. A, a, a fantastic complex robot, which is, I would argue, more complex than these robots in the car manufacturing plant. And it's working very hard now to produce all the proteins in your body at this moment. This is two meters in size, this is 24 nanometers. A slight difference in size. So we have to do with the effect of length scales. And you have to realize there are size, mass, energy, and force play a crucial role in your macro robot. We know how much a car weights, eh? but do you know how much a molecule weights? Weight does not play much of a role. What plays a role at the nanoscale, at the molecular scale, is flexibility, conformation of flexibility, viscosity, the interactions between molecules, interface phenomena. That is what dictates the molecular world, not so much gravity. It doesn't play much of a role. And of course, it's not so much about getting motion, but about controlling motion. Because it's a crazy world out there. It's the world of the Brownian motion. And we work at low Reynolds numbers. So you have to realize that the molecular world is slightly different from the macro world. The movements are also slightly different. So this is the ATPAs that I referred to earlier. This is the motor, uh, the electromotor. So both are rotary motors. And what is crucial for a rotary motor? Now, crucial for a rotary motor is rotation, of course, but also distinguish between left and right. And now I go back to very elementary class chemistry. This is a carbon-carbon single bond. And we all know there is free rotation around a carbon-carbon single bond with more than 100 megahertz under ambient conditions. But there is no, this is just thermal motion, it's not a motor, eh? it's just thermal motion and it rotates equally left or right, forward or backward, clockwise or counterclockwise. So how to distinguish left and right? And that is the real problem. How to control rotary motion and how to control left and right in the nano world? These are the fundamental questions. So how to control left and right? You have to break the symmetry and in Holland, when I was a boy, I grew up on a farm, I had these small wooden shoes, and I learned it by stepping with my right foot in the right wooden shoe. Because if you step with your right foot in the left wooden shoe, it hurts a lot, I tell you. <laughs> and for the rest of your life, you know what left and right means. <laughs> you never make that mistake again. So do distinguish between left and right, and this is crucial, this is a fundamental aspect of life. Yeah? The left-handed amino acids, the right-handed DNA, the right-handed sugars. So, we make single-handedness yeah, of the molecules, only right-handed or only left-handed, and then we can distinguish left and right. And this is the first motor that we built. You see here an axis, a carbon-carbon double bond. Normally you don't rotate because you don't rotate under ordinary conditions around a carbon-carbon double bond, but just like in your eye, when you hit it with light, you break temporarily one of the bonds, it splitches, yeah, it rotates, then it forms the double bond again. Extremely fast process. Actually, in our motor, we did femtosecond studies, and we found out that it's in the picosecond regime. So, here you see a rotor, you see four colors, it goes through four stages, and why do we call it a motor? Because it has controlled motion, you consume energy, you have directional movement, and you have a repetitive process. Think of your car. If there's no fuel in it, you won't get anywhere. 
If there's equal probability of going clockwise or counterclockwise, you wouldn't get anywhere either. So this is crucial. And it goes through four stages, a photochemical double bond isomerization, think of your eye, a helix inversion, double bond isomerization, helix inversion. A, four, a power stroke, four stage rotary motor. So these are the four, this is the molecule, and I will go through this quickly. You have here this, this molecule, you see here the helical structure. You have these small methyl substituents, they are indicated in red, CH3 groups. They are pointing away from the rest of the molecule, that makes this molecule stable. And now you hit with light, and people ask me all the time, how can it that it goes forward and not backward? Because you do a photochemical isomerization, and now you get this compound here, and you see here, these groups here, they are in a very crowded situation. Sterically hindrance, as we call it as chemists. And so this molecule wants to stabilize itself, and it does it by helix inversion. So we go from an M helix to a P helix, a left-handed helix to a right-handed helix, and now it's stable, because that is, it's nice, relaxed. And now you can do this another time, and another time, and you're back to the original situation. So here, we have a four-step, 360-degree rotary cycle. If we have the right-handed form of the molecule, it goes clockwise. If we have the left-handed form of the molecule, it goes counterclockwise. And we can spin it many times, as long as you hit it with light. Now, you can do all kinds of tricks there. What we have recently done is put heli helicates there. They were pioneered, actually, by another Nobel laureate, Jean-Marie Lane, many years ago. And what we do is we put these structures there, and you can make helicates. And as this rotary motor goes through the cycle, it changes the helicate, like DNA. But of course, this is only a small synthetic molecule. But you can go from a double helicate that is right-handed to a double helicate that is left-handed. And you can even go a step further, because we can go from polymers to right-handed helicates, to left-handed helicates, to polymers. To right. So it can go through different types of structures in a completely dynamic way. So here, we take materials that we can push out of equilibrium by energizing them, taking advantage of this rotary motor. Now you might wonder, how fast is this motor? And the original motor had one rotation per hour. Now that's not much of a motor. You cannot build a car with that. So people ask me all the time, can you speed up this motor? And we spent a decade or so to make 50 or so different designs. And now we are at a stage that we have 10 million rotations per second. And how do we do that? In particularly by widening this gap. Because you realize the photochemical step is extremely fast. But this helix inversion, when the rotor has to rotate onwards, it was this very slow step. Because these two halves interfere with each other. And so by widening this gap and changing the electronics, etc., we can tune. Now you might say, that's nice, 10 million times per second, is that real? Now, now a warning, because you have to get in energy from the light. You have to deal with quantum yields. You have to deal with the surface or with the material where you have these motors, the solution, the solvent, all these parameters. Take. So we have calculated now and measured, actually, that we have maybe about 3,000 rotations per second in our fastest motors. That's, yeah, because you cannot endlessly irradiate with a laser, of course, because you blow away your molecule. So now we can uh, go also to visible light driven system. We can buy metals there. And then you see here the motor, and it spins, and we go through all these cycles. And this is recent work where we have really shown that we can go to the visible spectrum and be tuned through metal binding. So this is inorganic chemistry. We take metal complexes and we can tune through the metal. We can tune the speed and the properties of the motor. I don't want to go into much detail, but just a way to, to tune the properties. And so with these motors, we can put them on surfaces in, in mesoscopic liquid crystal materials. We can control polymers and we can build a nano car. And I want to show you in this last 10 minutes or so, I don't know what's done, what is it up? Yeah. So what I want to show you, a few examples, how we design these systems. First of all, uh, this one. No, let me start with this one, a polymer. This is Kiesepone, what he did in Strasbourg not so long ago. He took our motor and made a polymer network. And then he can make a piece of plastic 
And when you irradiate it with light, the plastic contracts and can expand, contract and expand. So in contrast to normal plastic, you can simply have a light responsive plastic. And you might say, what can we do with it? You can make a plastic bag that contracts and expands. <laughs> but you can make, now think about plastic objects, you know, like coatings and so, and I'll come back to that. So what we did is, for instance, we took uh, the display materials that you have in your smartphone, your uh, mobile or in your uh, PC, and when you take away the glass plate, you know there is soft material, eh? but you push on your smartphone, the screen, and there is soft material behind it. Don't push too hard, eh? because then you destroy your smartphone. When I push here, yeah, on the screen, there is soft material. That is the liquid crystal material, these rod-like molecules. And the orientation of these rod-like molecules dictates what kind of pixel you have, what kind of colors. Because if you have a, a large helix, yeah, you get a Bragg reflection of red light. But when you have a shorter pitch, you get a Bragg reflection of blue light. And this is how you can make So, you can make pixels. So we, what we did is we put this motor there, and using the gyrality and the rotary motion of this motor, we can control actually the expansion or the contraction of this helical organization. And so we can make color pixels very easily. But we can do something else. Because when you take a thin film, a micrometer thin film, this is this soft material. And you see here, these are typically what you see here, the, this is the pattern what you see in this soft liquid crystal material. And you see here a glass rod. This is the dimensions, micrometer dimensions. That is swimming like a boat on these waves, because this is a corrugated surface. It's like eh, waves on the sea, soft material. The motor is in there, tiny amount only, one nanometer in size, 10,000 times smaller. Now, I don't touch anything. I hit it with light. And this is what you see. Completely autonomous motion, because the motor spins, the whole liquid crystal organization changes, the pitch changes, you see the color changing, it has snuff change in surface tension to rotate an object, and you see it rotates clockwise. You can make it rotating clockwise, counterclockwise, depending upon how we design it. When the students came to my office, I still remember this day in 2005 when they came to me, Ben, you have to come to watch our experiment. I was silent for five minutes because for the first time, six years after we had designed our motor, I saw with my naked eye this object spinning. And so this is how it works. You wind or unwind, you know, this helical organization. So it's a mechanical function that's amplified, and you can see an object really spinning. So that brings me to motors on surfaces. And why did we do that? Because if you have molecules in solution, and you want to make a device, say an electronic or an optical device or whatever, integrated component, you want to interface it with a surface, with a semiconductor, with any material, you know? And so we had to learn that. And so we built these motors with legs, and we put them on surfaces, for instance, this one via tie holes that give self-assembly on gold, and it works nicely after some attempts. And uh, then we build this windmill part. So we have a tin film of gold, for instance, or other metals, and we can then self-assemble a monolayer, and they all spin in the same direction if you do it properly. So our ancestors in Holland built these nice windmills. Yeah? We are a little bit smaller, one billion, one billion in size times small. But our ancestors were also really smart 500 years ago because they built them on dikes to pump the water out of our polders and canals because Holland, there's a good reason they call it Le Pays Bas, it's low, eh? 40% of our country is below sea level, so our ancestors used this to pump the water out and we might need them again in the future when the sea level raises. I don't think my nano propellers or nano windmill part will be very useful. But what we try to do now is to build them on dikes, you know, and to make kind of nano devices and so, because they all nicely spin. So we can make, of course, smart surfaces. Here you see a tripod. Now the motors are standing up. You see the axle is now different. It's, 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 the axle is parallel to the surface. So this unit here rotates towards the surface or away from the surface. And we put a small piece of Teflon. Eh? Think of your cooking pan. They, they uh, of course, uh, repel water. So when it's exposed to the outside world, it repels water. 
And now you can put it towards the surface and you can make droplet changing, you can make surfaces, thickness changing, etc. So we can make the shape of droplet changing because the hydrophobicity changes. So you make smart surfaces and in the future think about these windows, you know, that clean themselves or repel water or what. That's the idea behind it. And then we build a nano car. And people ask me all the time, why do you why 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 did you do this? <laughs> and the reason is not that we wanted to build a nano car, of course, but uh, because we wanted to show that rotation, like in your car, rotation can be converted into translation over a surface. That was the idea. That was the fundamental question. And my students were a little bit jealous of the engineers at Delft University and these universities because they build these solar powered cars, you have seen them on television, and they can go to Australia for this car race. And they had a couple of weeks in Australia. My students were really jealous. And I said, look, we cannot do that because we are not engineers. But we are molecular engineers. So let's try to make a four-wheel drive nano car. And if you succeed, you can go to a conference in Australia. <laughs> now, of course, the first attempts and the first generation of PSD students failed because it took us seven years to build it. But then we succeeded. Here is the nano car. You see one, two, three, four wheels. We pulse it with an STM tip. And we, we wanted to demonstrate how to convert rotary motion and translation motion at a single molecule level. And here you see the motor moving, the car moving, sorry. And it moves over the surface when you pulse it, yeah, uh, about seven to nine nanometers. Now, one morning. When you look at the motors, these transporters in your muscles or in the filaments in your cell, they move different from your car. In the molecular world, the nano world, yeah, it's more like this. You see here our system, it's lifted up a little bit. Eh? When you have a big molecule and it sticks to a surface, it will stick there and will not do anything. But due to these motors, it's lifted up a little bit and then likely the motion is like this. So it walks over the surface. This is reality, I think, at the molecular level. So, let me skip this. Oh, they, let me show you one example. And that you have probably, this was, a, my students have been working on this recently, and we succeeded to build a symmetric system with two wheels without garality. Because you realize it's symmetric. It's completely symmetric. And we built this for the following reason. I don't know if you ever realized, when you look at a car moving forward, both wheels go forward, eh? But when, and, and they go clockwise, eh? Look in this direction. But now, when you are a driver and you sit behind the steering wheel, I don't know if you ever realized, this wheel goes clockwise and this wheel goes counterclockwise. They move in opposite directions, otherwise you wouldn't go forward. Think about it when next time when you sit in a car. And so we build this and we could make it moving forward. And I, in few of the time, I don't want to go through the details, but this is what we see. One rotates yeah, clockwise and the other rotates counterclockwise, just as in the car. And we are now studying them on surfaces again to look in more detail. And we built now these nano roads and we really want to control them, how they move over the surface and can transport load. But let me finish in the last two minutes. Yeah? Let me finish with the following. And this was another question, another challenge. Can you use chemical catalysis, a chemical fuel, instead of light? In our body, ATP, a lot of these motors are all propelled by chemical fuels. And so the idea was, can we build a submarine? And then we had to think about the fuel, but as there is plenty of glucose in your body, we thought, let's take glucose as a fuel. And so what we did is we took a nanotube, a carbon nanotube, put two enzymes, glucose oxidase that converts glucose, generates hydrogen peroxide, and catalase that converts hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water. So here's the design. This is the nanotube with the two enzymes, 100 nanometer, you see? And here what you see is a tiny spider of these nanotubes. They aggregate a little bit. And this is water under the microscope. I don't touch it. You see here bubbles, these black dots that are the bubbles of oxygen. And as long as there is sugar, it autonomously moves, completely autonomously, when there is no sugar anymore, it stops. When you add sugar again, it starts moving again. Again, this is very primitive steps towards a nano swimmer, and maybe yeah, towards the fantastic voyage in the future. 
So will we have nanorobots that in the future will be injected by the doctor in your blood vein to go for a diseased cell or to deliver a drug? This is science fiction, eh? like Asimov. I don't know. Maybe. I think in 40, 50 years from now we might have that. Once you know how to make something autonomously propel, it might work. The first steps have been made. But the prediction is, I would say the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And this is what we all together as scientists try to do. So let me finish with concluding that going from programmed molecules to responsive and adaptive functions and motion, we can make really dynamic systems. And then we might have energy converters, responsive materials. I showed you precision therapeutics maybe adaptive catalyst or soft robotics. There are many opportunities for all the young people here. There are tremendous opportunities to invent in the future. And we need, of course, chemistry, physics, biology, all these disciplines together to make that possible. It would not be possible at all, wasn't it, for all the talented young people in my group, of course, the granting agencies, but in particular, all these young stars. And I am really indebted to them for all their efforts and of course, this is my current group, but uh, also all the people that were in the past decades in my group. I own a lot to them to make this possible. But I want to go back in time to my final slide, Mr. Chairman. Because there is a clear message from the past. And that is from my great hero, Leonardo da Vinci, who said, where nature finishes producing his own species, man begins with the help of nature to create an infinity of species. And for the young people here in the audience, which are most of you, imagine the unimaginable. Thank you very much. Instead of wires, you can construct molecules and they will perform the same function as some metals, etc. So chemistry, it, it was, I think, the topic and frontier of sciences. Chemistry, physics, material sciences, biology. And really it shows in the last slide that creativity is behind it. And uh, it's in, in our force to, to create new, new materials, new, new world. I don't say the life, but nevertheless, <laughs> probably one day as well. So you have a unique, unique opportunity to raise a question to the Nobel laureate, who it, and uh, probably he will not answer, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. your life, you will say, I asked a question which was not answered. You remember, I, in one boss conference, I remember that uh, the Nobel laureate, um, uh, uh, Barry Sharpless, couldn't an answer the question. And he, after this, the next day, he found an answer to the audience. Now, right. please, the floor is open to questions. Who will be the first? It's over yeah. there. Yes. Do yes. you have a microphone or yeah. how you will, you will shout? Maybe you stand up and speak oh. a bit loud. No, this car was on the solid surface. Thank you for the question. This was moving under the solid surface. Yeah? But of course, the movement depends upon which environment you are. If you are in a plastic or in a very viscous medium yeah? or on the surface, uh, movement depends upon what interactions with you have. Eh? And the, this is a very good point because moving over a trajectory, over a surface in the nano world, your car when it's on the street, it doesn't fly in the air or flies away, unless there is a heavy storm, you know, like a tornado in the United States. You see these cars flying in the air. But normally, at the molecular world, realize that either molecules stick to a surface or they fly from the surface. So the trick is, and what nature learned, is how to balance the interactions. So it's not sticking too stiff, yeah, and still can move, but doesn't fly away. 
And, and this is really a challenge that we are fighting at this moment with my students to build roads and to see if we can control the interaction. So thank you for the question. It's really important. But here we show, indeed, that it stays on the surface and it moves over the surface. Yeah. Yes, okay. Okay. Yes. Fast. Oh. Yes. Yes. Um, what is the thought process and the whole process into creating the molecules? So do you run the simulations? Do you use it as like trial and error? And what's the general? Yeah, I did. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, how do we design these molecules? Uh, of course, we have a lot of experience in the group in the meantime eh, of, to design it. Uh, but many of the new motors that we design, we do also calculations to see what the barriers are. Because sometimes we need, sometimes we need a slow motor. Yeah? Sometimes we need a very fast one. For the switching, the drugs, you want something that switches and then goes back in 12 hours or in 6 hours. Uh, and so we can tune those properties via synthesis but it's better to first do some calculation before you do a lengthy synthesis and, uh, and see if the properties, maybe the barrier for rotation is okay. Eh? Yeah, so thanks for the question. Yeah, that's the kind of approach we follow. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, you were first. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that is a really nice question. Self-repairing systems, I had no time to talk about that. But when you, uh, this is a challenge, because in our body, you know, it repairs itself, yeah? Uh, but when you have a scratch in your car, or you have a piece of plastic, or you shatter your window, it doesn't repair itself. Now, repair, how to repair mechanisms is a really nice challenge for material science, yeah? So, when you have these vacuoles, these tiny capsules, you know, that you can open when light hits it, eh? Think about you put a monomer in it. Yeah? You have a scratch in your plastic or in the coating of your car. Light comes through it, it opens, monomer flows out, it repairs itself. That's the idea. That's what we're working on. Thank you. application if you insert this uh, molecular motor in, a, in an organism in a, maybe in a yeah. just a organic uh, solution uh, how big are chances that uh, this motor will be modified by the system how to prevent it yeah uh, I mean at a certain point when you what we're doing now and what is real important is to get into water because if you, you can realize when we make switchable drugs, we work in water, because then it's compatible cell or in buffer. And for the motors, we are also working on water soluble. I showed you the system where we had tubes, vesicles, tube, vesicles. So these are systems that work in water. Now, of course, when you would put it in an organism, your body, like a drug, it will oxidize at some point, it degrades it or whatever. This is quite normal to their system. So you can, of course, stabilize that via all kinds of tricks. You can stabilize molecules, eh? modify them, etc. But you have to keep the properties. So we are building molecules that operate in water, that operate in buffers that can be used under physiological conditions, that are stable enough to work for several hours or several days. And then we might use them to control biological process. That's our dream. For instance, when you have a motor, you can think of stimulating replication, cellular functions, or maybe artificial muscles. That's what we try to do. Of course, these are big challenges. It's not easy, and maybe we will not succeed, but if you don't try. But thanks for the question. Yes? Uh, yes, I wanted to ask, uh, is there a possibility to build uh, multifunctional molecules? To build? Multifunctional. Yeah. Yeah, it's another interesting aspect where you control different functions. And I tell you what we did. 
I had no time to discuss this. But you know all what a catalyst is, eh? a catalyst in the chemical industry to convert A to B. What we build is a motor inside the catalyst. And then we make compound A. Then we switch with light, first step eh, of the rotary cycle, we make compound B. Then we go the next step and we make compound C and then we go back to. So you can make different yeah, tasks in a single system because they are dynamic and they react to an external signal. So multi-machine-like function. That's a nice challenge. And that's what we are. We, we published a paper on that in science, actually, on this switchable catalyst. Uh, have you ever tried to uh, turn on and off the enzymatic activity? Yeah. 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 You can do two approaches. You can either build a ligand that blocks the enzyme, and you switch off on and off enzyme activity, or you can build the switch inside an, an enzyme on the protein. That can also be done. And uh, we and other, several other groups use that principle, yeah. So you, you have here your active side of your enzyme. You build here a switch with a ligand. You hook it up, eh? by your conjugation eh? to the protein. And then you can switch it on, uh, sorry, off. It blocks. You remove it. It's still dangling there, but the substrate can go in. So there you can control biological function of an enzyme, yes. Yeah, this, there are some nice examples in the literature. On this side, yes, please. Yes. Uh, have, you, have you thought about making a flying molecules or travel in more rarefied material? Flying molecules? My, man, my molecules fly all the time, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. No, but you know what I, you, I, I know to make something that can do control fly, you mean? I've not really thought about it. We are already happy that we can move it in solution on the surface, etc. And, uh, but it's, it's an interesting challenge if you could but realize molecules in the gas phase, yeah, they move. I mean, I'm not, not so much in gas phase chemistry, but people can tell you that uh, that will be a tough challenge. But I invite you to come out to our labs and to help us to, to realize that. You're more than happy to come. But that is uh, to have molecules in the gas phase and to control the motion will not be so easy. But I would not say that it's impossible. But you have five different parameters than when you work in solution, of course. Eh? What is your, the greatest challenge? The greatest challenge? On, on, in the gas phase. Yes. Now, <laughs> it's already not easy to get these big molecules in the gas phase without destroying them, you know. Of course, we can get them in a mass spectrometer to determine the structure, but often they, they, they fragment. And to get controlled conditions in the gas phase uh, is not that easy, eh? Because these are big, these are eh, under under conditions that you can use them eh, to study them, etc. But maybe mass spectrometry, but but that's special conditions, of course. But I wouldn't say that's impossible. I've never really seriously looked at it. We are already extremely happy that we can control them on the surface or in solution. And once again, like it's aircraft, no one thought that they would fly. No, no, no. I I, I think it's a, I like the I like the idea, but you see. He, uh, I have no answer to him. So, so you, the old chairman, what predicted correctly? I don't know. I don't know. The last question, if you have one, yes, please. No, the last one. Oh, but yes. I have a question about the functions of those mechanisms you have to make. I mean, if you are making something more complex, like a robot or yeah. 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 If you uh, activate something with light, you are lighting everything in this space or region. And if you are doing something with the purpose, you are turning on everything in the same time. So how do you uh, make something which rotates or switches and do something else? Uh, not the you mean a, a different function? Yeah. Yeah, but you can, you realize you can make multi-purpose switches and rotors. Eh? So for instance, you can build in pH sensitive groups, redox sensitive groups, uh, metal binding groups. I showed you one example where you can control via other means a second or third modality. And that is what we actually try to do. Of course, there's a long way to make multi-component systems that you can individually address them. 
When you have a light activation, of course, you activate, if you have an ensemble, you activate several molecules. Like in your eye, you activate several of these molecules. And maybe a million or so. So, uh, so but light can be, be, we did orthogonal, we have even used two different wavelengths of light to switch on one function and to switch on the other function. Oh, that's possible. Oh, we published a paper last year where we were switching two different distinct functions. Uh, and, and we did one with, uh, say, a 400 nanometer and the other, if I recall it correctly, uh, 700 nanometer or so, and that worked f really nice. So we could switch on a binding function in water, and we could switch on another function with a different wavelength of light. So they were dual switchable, and these are our first steps. So yes, it's possible, but there is always, and the colleagues here know that much better than I am because they are experts, when you excite a molecule, you get energy transfer, you get interference of normal force, etc. So the, let me give you an example. When we build our windmills on the surface, yeah, initially my students build them with short legs. Now, first of all, why two legs? I didn't tell you. Two legs, because if you have one leg, the whole thing starts to rotate. Eh? You don't want it. So two legs. But then they had short legs. And what happened when you excited, the energy immediately went to the surface, yeah, was quenched, and the motor didn't function. And we should have known that, of course because this energy transfer is way too fast. So yes, these are the kind of aspects that you have to deal with, that you get energy transfer if you have multi-component systems, that when something happens here, it might happen there, etc. But you can engineer it and design it. It's not easy, but it can be done. Thanks for the question. OK, unfortunately, I have to stop uh, the discussion. Uh, it, it could have been foreseen for additional an hour. But I have a good news. We, you are all invited to go outside to take a group photo with Ben Feringa. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And before that, I would like to thank on behalf of all of you and present some students' uh, gifts. I don't know what is it in, in back. <laughs> but nevertheless, really, we thank you again for this wonderful lecture. <laughs> really, it was a pleasure. Just thank you.